All right, ready to dive deep into English grammar. Sounds exciting. I know, grammar can be a little intimidating, but think of this deep dive as like a cheat sheet to really boost your confidence in English. We'll be focusing on the most common errors that even, you know, intermediate and advanced learners still make. And we're going to use this awesome three-part guide to help us break it all down step by step. Exactly. So you not only learn to spot these mistakes, but you actually know how to fix them. Exactly. So are you ready to transform your English from good to amazing? Absolutely. Let's get started. Okay, let's start with sentence structure, which is super important. It really is the foundation. Kind of like building a house, right? You can't start with the roof. Exactly. You need a strong base. In writing, that's a complete sentence. What's interesting is that even native speakers sometimes mess this up. Oh, I've totally been there. I remember in college, I would write these sentences that just kind of trailed off, and my professor would be like, where's the rest of the house? It happens. But the key is that a sentence needs a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. It has to be able to stand on its own. Makes sense. So a fragment is like a sentence that's missing a leg. It just can't support itself. Love that analogy. Now, how do we avoid creating these unfinished sentences? Well, the guide gives some great tips, like watching out for words like because, although, since, at the beginning of your sentences. Okay, because those can sometimes lead to those dependent clauses. Right, and those can't stand alone as sentences. They have to be connected to an independent clause, you know, to create a complete thought. Okay, so, for example. If you write, because I went to the store... That's a fragment, yeah. right? It's like, what happened at the store? Exactly. To make it complete, you could add, I bought some groceries. Ah, uh, okay. So because I went to the store, I bought some groceries. Now it's a full sentence, like adding that missing leg. Perfect. Okay, that makes sense. Now how about run-on sentences? Those are the ones that just keep going on forever. Right. It's like trying to fit too much furniture in one tiny room. It just gets so cluttered. Totally. The key here is to use proper punctuation to create boundaries between your thoughts. Like periods. Yes. Periods, semicolons, or conjunctions. Uh, so like dividers. Exactly. So instead of saying, I love reading, it's a great way to learn, you would say. I love reading. It's a great way to learn. Exactly. You give each thought its own space. Okay. Love it. Those analogies are super helpful. Okay. And speaking of making things clear... Let's talk about subject-verb agreement. Ooh, yes. Have you ever been stuck trying to figure out if you need a singular or plural verb? All the time. It can be so tricky. It really can. The main thing is to figure out what the subject of the sentence is and then make sure the verb matches. So ignore any distracting phrases in between. Exactly. Just focus on the main ingredient. For instance, the list of books are on the table. Oh, are. Should be is. You got it. The list of books is on the table. Much better. Hmm. Okay, so just match the verb to that core subject. Makes sense. Now, last but not least, let's tackle misplaced modifiers. Ooh, those sneaky little things. I know. They can completely change the meaning of the sentence. And sometimes even make them unintentionally hilarious. The guide had this great example. She almost drove her car for six hours every day. So it sounds like she never actually drove. It does, doesn't it? Like, she almost did it, but then didn't. The key is to put the modifier right next to the word it's describing. So she drove her car for almost six hours every day. Perfect. Now it's clear and no longer funny unless you meant it to be. Right. So precision is key. Who knew grammar could be so entertaining? I know. It's all about finding the right words and putting them in the right order. And we've only just scratched the surface. Welcome back to our deep dive on common English grammar errors. Are you ready for more? I am. My brain is getting a good workout today. That's the goal. So today let's focus on something that's often overlooked but super important, punctuation. Ooh, yeah, punctuation. It sounds simple enough, but I'll admit it used to trip me up all the time. I think we've all been there. Sometimes it's hard to know where to even begin, but really punctuation is key for clear writing. It is, like commas, semicolons, dashes. They can all be a bit overwhelming. They can. It's like learning a secret code. But once you crack the code, your writing just becomes so much clearer and more impactful. Exactly. So speaking of cracking the code, let's talk about comma splices. The guide mentioned that those are a really common mistake. Oh, they are, even for native speakers. So what exactly is a comma splice? Well... It's when you use a comma to join two independent clauses that could totally stand on their own as sentences. Okay, so instead of a comma, you should really use a fin. 
Period? Yes. Yeah. A period. You could also use a semicolon. Right. Or a comma with a coordinating conjunction. Exactly. So, like, instead of saying, I love to travel, I've been to over 20 countries, you could say. I love to travel. I've been to over 20 countries. Exactly. Or, I love to travel. I've been to over <laughs> 20 countries. Or, I love to travel, and I've been to over 20 countries. You got it. I feel like I'm getting the hang of this. Now, what about commas where they don't belong? Ah, uh, yes. That's another common problem, like adding too much salt to your food. It can just ruin the whole thing. Exactly. A good example is when people use commas after introductory phrases. Oh, yeah. Like, after finishing my homework, I decided to relax. Should there be a comma there? In that case, yes. Because after finishing my homework is setting the stage for the rest of the sentence. Okay, so it needs that little pause. Exactly. So commas are kind of like strategic pauses in music then. That's a great way to put it. Okay, let's move on to apostrophes. These little guys are important for possession and contractions. Apostrophes. I remember learning about them in school, but sometimes I still get confused. Like, the cat's toy versus the cat's toys. When do you add the S after the apostrophe? It depends if the noun is singular or plural. If it's singular, you add an apostrophe and an S, like cat's toy. But if it's plural and already ends in S, then you just add the apostrophe after the S. So cat's toys. Okay, so it's like a little flag marking who owns the toy. Right. Now, irregular plural nouns can be tricky, like children. Mm -hmm. Since it doesn't end in S, you treat it like a singular noun and add the apostrophe and the S. So children's toys. Okay, I'll try to remember that. Now, what about prepositions? Those little words like in, on, at can be tricky. They really can be. They often depend on the verb or the specific expression you're using. And sometimes there aren't clear rules. I know. Sometimes I try to translate directly from my native language and it just sounds wrong. That happens a lot. The best thing to do is to pay attention to how native speakers use them. Like you might say, I'm interested in learning English, but the correct way to say it is, I'm interested in learning English. Okay, so it's more about getting a feel for the language than memorizing rules. Exactly. Don't be afraid to ask questions or check a dictionary if you're not sure. Great advice. Now, before we move on, I want to talk about articles. You know, A, N, the. Those are essential. I know. They seem so small, but they can really change the meaning of a sentence. Right. A and N are for any member of a group, and V is for a specific one, like I saw a dog versus I saw the dog. Exactly. One is just any dog. The other is a specific dog. And one of the trickiest things is knowing when to use them and when to leave them out. I know. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't say the dogs are loyal animals. You'd just say dogs are loyal animals. Right. No article needed for plural nouns when you're talking about them in general. Okay, so it's all about the context. Wow, we covered a lot of ground just now. From <laughs> comma splices to apostrophes to articles. We did. But we're not done yet. There's still more to learn. All right, welcome back to our English Grammar Deep Dive. Are you ready for the final round? Absolutely. I hope you've been taking notes. I know I have. We've learned so much already. But now it's time to take it to the next level. We're talking about advanced grammar concepts. The kind of stuff that really separates the good from the great. Exactly. So let's get started with parallel structure. Honestly, this concept always kind of intimidated me. I get it. The definition can sound a bit complex. It does but the guide explains it as using the same grammatical pattern for elements in a sentence that have the same function. Right, so basically you wanna make sure that similar elements are expressed in a similar way. It's all about creating that balance and flow. So like if you're listing things, they should all have the same grammatical structure. Precisely, like instead of saying she likes reading to swim and hiking, you would say. She likes reading, swimming and hiking. You got it, or she likes to read, to swim and to hike. So all gerunds or all infinitives. Makes sure. sense. Now it sounds so much smoother. It does. It's like creating a beautifully symmetrical garden. Everything is in harmony. Love that analogy. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we have collocations. What are those again? They're those natural combinations of words that native speakers just use without thinking. But they can be tricky for language learners. I know. Sometimes I feel like I'm just guessing which words go together. Like, should I say make a decision or take a decision? Good question. In English, we'd say make a decision. It's all about learning those subtle pairings that just sound right. So it's more about developing an ear for the language than memorizing rules. Right. But there are resources that can help, like collocation dictionaries. Cool. 
I'll go check those out. <laughs> okay, last but not least, let's talk about idiomatic expressions. Oh, yeah, idioms. Those can be tough. I know. They're like secret codes. I remember hearing someone say, kick the bucket, and I was so confused. I can imagine. Idioms don't always make sense literally. You have to learn their figurative meanings. So, kick the bucket actually means to die. Yep. It's about understanding the meaning beyond the individual words. So it's like learning to read between the lines. Exactly. Idioms can be tricky, so don't use them unless you're sure of their meaning. Good point. Now, before we wrap up, any other advice for advanced English learners? Sure. First, mix up your sentence structure. Use a variety of simple, compound, and complex sentences to keep your writing interesting. Yeah, like adding different spices to a dish. And what else? Be careful with the passive voice. It can make your writing sound weak if you overuse it. So use the active voice whenever possible. Exactly. It's more direct and engaging. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. We have. From basic sentence structure to advanced concepts like idioms and collocations. Remember, the key to mastering English grammar is practice. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. Exactly. Everyone makes mistakes, even native speakers. So keep practicing and you'll get there. And that's a wrap on this episode of The Deep Dive. We hope you've learned some valuable tips to boost your English skills. And remember, if you want to review any of the information we covered today, you can always check out the three-part guide that we used. It's packed with helpful explanations and examples. Exactly. So keep practicing and keep exploring the amazing world of English grammar. Until next time. See you then.